For tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thursday morning, December the 29th, 1977. Midwinter camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. This morning's speaker is Reverend Carol McCarroll of Paducah, Kentucky. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28 is a very important scripture for us in this walk of deliverance and in our family relationships that we need to recognize. It says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Now, whenever you see a city that has no defense, you see a city that the enemy of that city can come and go at will. Now, most of you know that in ancient days, whenever a city was built, its first line of defense was the wall that was built around about that city. And sometimes they had an outer wall, and there'd be a space, and there'd be an inner wall. And the inner wall would even be taller than the outer wall. Now, the Word of God said that a man who does not rule his own spirit is like a city without walls. Now, picture yourself now that if you lived in an ancient city, and you had uh, uh, enemies that lived all around you, and these enemies without the wall about your city could come and go whenever they wanted to. They could pillage your city, they could rob it, they could rape it at will. Come and go. Come and stay a while and then leave. Now the Word of God says that whenever we do not control our own spirit, then we're just exactly like that kind of a city. A city that has no walls. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a man whom God anointed with the Holy Spirit in a great and mighty way. He was the first king of Israel. And that first king of Israel's name was Saul. And Saul was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Saul stood head and shoulders above every other man in all of Israel. Not only physically, but he had a very humble and a meek spirit. You recall whenever they came to anoint him as a king, that he was hid amongst the baggage, amongst the stuff. And they had to go pull him out, say, you're the one that God said should be our king. And we want to anoint you as such and set you before the people. Saul had a very humble spirit in the beginning. But something began to happen with Saul. You know, some people cannot take any type of authority. They just simply can't handle it. And whenever you give it to them, things begin to take place in their lives that are adverse to them personally as well as to other people. And the same thing happened to Saul. He thought just because that he was king of Israel now, that he could do whatever he wanted to do. He had the approval of God the Father. He had the approval of the people. God had said, this is the one who should be your king. And the people had united behind him and had anointed him as such before all the congregation of Israel. And so Saul, instead of continuing to walk humble before the Lord, began to do just the opposite. Now they were in a battle. Samuel was to come and to offer sacrifice before the battle. But Samuel's appearance was detained. And so Saul, becoming anxious to get the thing over with, went ahead and offered a sacrifice to God himself, taking the place of the priest of God or the prophet of God. As soon as he had done this thing, Samuel appeared upon the scene. What have you done? What have you done? Of course, he had an excuse. You didn't come. And I went ahead, and Samuel rebuked Saul. And the Word of God says that the Spirit of God departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. That's the King James Version. Now, what it's really saying is that the Lord allowed an evil spirit to come upon him. God doesn't send evil spirits upon people, but he allows them to come. You get a good picture of that in the book of Job, whenever Satan came against Job and accused him before God. And God gave him leave 
to afflict Job in the ways that he afflicted him. Not only Job, but all of his possessions and his children. But he was hindered in taking his life. Now, the enemy can only go as far as God will allow him to go. And then he can go no further. But now, Saul had an evil spirit that came upon him. And this evil spirit came upon him and troubled him deeply. He had tremendous headaches. And this young boy, whom God had chosen to be the next king of Israel, even before he was chosen to be the king, he was chosen to come and play for Saul. And he'd play upon his instruments. And he played the harp. And as he played the instrument, doesn't say anything at all about his singing. He just says that he came and he played. Played upon the instrument. I want you to know that instruments before God have a very, very, very important place in worship before the Father. David, whom God said about him, he is a man after his own heart, wrote in Psalms 150, how that we should praise the Lord. He said, praise him upon the harp, praise him upon the stringed instruments, praise him upon the trumpets, praise him upon the timbrel, praise him upon the cymbals, and in the high-sounding cymbals, that everything that hath breath, David said, praise the Lord. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. We need to praise God. We need to praise God in every way. As David was called to play in the presence of King Saul, that evil spirit would be part from Saul. It would be gone for a period of time. Then only to come back again. Why did it come? Why did it go? Why did it go? Why did it come? Constantly a cycle. Coming and going. Coming and going. Coming and going. Even one time we see that the evil spirit was on Saul and he began to prophesy in the midst of the prophets. Can you imagine that? Now, there's many instances in the Word of God where evil spirits would prophesy through people. Evil spirits. And this thing came up on Saul, and people began to rejoice. They said, well, he's going to be all right now. But David had a hesitancy in his spirit, a check in his spirit. And sure enough, he wasn't long again until David was in the presence of Saul, and he took his javelin, and he tried to kill David. Twelve times he tried to murder David. And twelve times his efforts ended in failure. But the evil spirit was driving him. Now, brothers and sisters, we need to realize that we must control our own human spirit. Now, don't think for a moment that we don't have a human spirit or don't have a spirit before we're saved. Because we do. It is deprived. As far as God is concerned, it is dead because it's not reaching out to the Father, it's not reaching out to God, but instead it is backing up everything in the human nature. God's Word tells us that out of the heart proceedeth, what? Adulteries, murders, fornications, or out of the heart can proceed blessings, blessings of God. You know, out of the heart the mouth speaketh. And whenever you hear a man walking around and he's cursing or he's telling evil stories, or she's doing something lewd with her lips, telling something that shouldn't be told, or speaking something that shouldn't be spoken. You can tell for, for a fact what's in that person's heart. Their heart is filled with darkness and with wickedness. But the heart can be filled with life, and can be filled with love, and can be filled with the blessed Holy Spirit. And that's what we all need. Can you say amen? We need that heart filled with the things of the living God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Now, Saul had a terrible problem. But his problem was no more than many, many, many people today. Right now in America. Perhaps even some of us right here at Hot Springs. We might have a problem in controlling our spirit. You know, it's a wonderful thing what God did whenever he gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us that power to control the member of our body that's the hardest to control. Have you ever said something and you wish that you had never said it? You know, I've said things and I go home, get down on my knees and I pray and I say, Oh God, forgive me and cause him to forget that I ever said it. Have you ever done something like that? Huh? Have you? Amen. Have you ever made what they call sometimes a Freudian slip? Say something, you know, and you really reveal what's on the inside whenever you say it? Have you ever done that? And you're embarrassed about it. You see, whenever the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit, He gave us the power to control this instrument. I remember one old minister 
when he was talking about the tongue and the trouble that it causes. And he spoke about what James said. You know, it's like a little spark that causes a whole woods to catch on fire. Or it's like the, the rudder of a huge ship. It can steer the whole ship. He said, God put the tongue where it ought to be. So that mean, ugly, untamable uh, animal, he put it in a cage with pearly white bars to keep it there. Hallelujah. And sometimes, folks, we ought to just let those white bars crunch down on that old animal. Amen. But God gave us the Holy Spirit to control our inner man, to control us. Now, as we allow the Spirit of God to grow in us, in 1 John chapter 3, he tells us that his seed is in us. Well, his seed is his Spirit planted within us, in the inner man, planted in us. Now, every farmer knows or anyone that's ever put out any garden at all, knows that whenever you put the seed in the soil, that the crop's not there yet. But the seed's got to grow. It's got to germinate. And then it begins to sprout upwards. And then the plant begins to grow. And then the fruit on the plant comes. And then the harvest. And this is what we all want to do. Now, the Lord wants us to allow that seed, His Spirit, that He has placed in us to begin to grow. And the only way that it can grow is if we'll do the things that God has told us to do. Now, one of the main and most important things that God has said for us to do is to find out from His Word how that we should live. How that we should live. Now, there are several authorities that we need to recognize. And God's main authority is he himself. For every man, woman, and child, God must come first. And then the second authority that we must recognize is the family. The family. And then the third, of course, is the church. And then the fourth is our government. And the fifth is our employment. God, the family, the church, the government, and then our employment. Those five areas of authority are very, very important for us to see. Now, the first thing we must do is to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our spirit. And then we must love our neighbor as ourselves. As we spoke yesterday morning about possessing the land. This is what we must do first of all. And then secondly, we must realize our position in our family and begin to bring our family in family order. Now, how many of you are members of a church somewhere here in these United States? Give up your hand. Amen. All right. That's almost 100%. If you're not a member somewhere, shame on you. You ought to get be one. Hallelujah. I don't believe God's through with the church yet. I believe that the church is his body. Hallelujah. And we need to be united with it. Now, how many have ever been a member of a church that's had problems? I mean bad problems. Slip up your hand. All right. I want to make a statement now. I doubt very seriously if the church has ever had one problem that ever began in the church. But I would say it's almost 100% true that all the problems that the church has, that you and I and the other people of that church have brought them to the church. We brought our, our problems there. Now, if we will have our relationship with God, our relationship in our family, brought under subjection to the authority of God's Word, then we'll not have the problems in our churches that we have. And our churches will become the body of Christ that they really and truly ought to be. God wants the church to be glorious. Now, I want to speak to you this morning for the next few minutes, keeping these things I've already said in mind from the book of Ephesians. And I want to get into some family relationships and how that our family, Ephesians chapter 5, how that our families should begin to function before the Lord and what happens Whenever we do not function, and what happens whenever we do function? Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Beginning in verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And that's very important. That's the first thing that should happen. 
We said yesterday, we said again this morning, God must come first. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Each one, each member of the family, the father, the mother, and the children coming together and submitting themselves first to God the Father and secondly to one another. This will get every problem on the right road to being solved. And he went on to say, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Notice verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the whole body. Now, gentlemen, if your wives aren't what they ought to be in your sight, if they're not pleasing you the way they ought to please you, if they're not doing what you think they should do as a wife, then it's up to you to see that those things change. It's up to you to make of her the wife that she ought to be. You say, well, now, why she don't cooperate with me? Well, God says, first of all, that you must submit to him. You must submit to him. This is why it's so important that every marriage, every marriage, every man that come together, that their marriage must, first of all, be made in heaven. Hallelujah. That God should ordain that marriage. That you should know that you're brought together by the Lord himself. We pray over our four children every night. We ask God to take care of the little boys and the little girls that are somewhere in this United States or maybe somewhere in the world that will one day be the wives of our two little boys and the husbands of our two little girls. We pray that God will protect them, that God will save their souls, that God will teach them how to be good husbands, how to be good wives. We get our people in our church to pray for our little children. We say, Grandmother, would you pray for little Daniel? Would you be sure to pray for Daniel every day? Asking God to have his hand upon Daniel and pray for the little girl who one of these days will be Daniel's wife. We do that with our children. First of all, your marriage should be made in heaven. And every one of us should begin to teach our children that marriage is for life. So many people enter into marriage. Well, if it don't work out, you know, we can get a divorce. And so many people today are using the loopholes that Jesus gave us for divorce to justify the breakdown in their marriage life. I said to justify the breakdown in their marriage life. Now, it is true that Jesus said you're free if one partner commits adultery on the other or if one partner deserts the other. But you better be sure that the party that's supposed to be innocent is truly innocent. I said truly innocent. I said truly innocent. Something happened. Hallelujah. Praise God. Something broke loose, didn't it? Amen. Now, we need to realize that. And if we're truly innocent, God knows. Don't be so cold and so frigid that you drive that man or you drive that woman into the arms of somebody else. Don't be such a lazy wife or such a hateful husband that you come in one day and they're gone, they pack their bags, and they've left. There's many people that have been left because of that. Marriage is for life until death do us part. And if there is a second marriage, it must be in the Lord. Some people have lost their husbands, lost their wives, and they'll go out and marry the first eligible person that they meet, whether or not they're in the Lord or not. Now, there's been a lot of ministries that's been ruined because they did not marry in the perfect will of God. They would not listen to the counsel of wise people who've been touched by the hand of God and say, you better be sure, you better be sure. So many times people think that life's going to pass them by before they get a chance to really get married. Well, folks, that's not the case. 
Solomon said a long time ago, it's better to dwell on the corner of a housetop than in a whole house with a brawling woman. Hallelujah. If you haven't found that out yet, sir, just marry one. You'll find out. Amen. Solomon was a, he could speak from experience. He had how many wives and how many concubines? I figured up one time, was about, how many was it? Was it 700 wives and how many wives? 300 concubines. One fellow said, well, you know, it wouldn't be so bad having 700 wives and concubines, but can you imagine having a thousand mother-in-laws? <laughs> now, gentlemen, whenever we marry a woman, we take on the responsibility of that woman to being her head. That doesn't just mean being her boss. In fact, that really is a subjugated term. That shouldn't even be used. But you take upon the responsibility before God, before all of mankind, as being her provider, as being not only her provider for physical things, but also her provider in spiritual things. Did you know the wife is to be to you like the church is to be to the Lord Jesus Christ? And the Lord uses the sun and the moon as an illustration of that. Here's a beautiful, lovely sun up here. And it shines in brilliance and glory. And here's the moon over here that rules in darkness. But it can only rule in darkness and shine as the sun shines upon it. And the only way that the sun can shine upon the moon is if the moon will stand in the presence of the sun. Hallelujah. And as it stands there, it begins to give out a brilliance. Now the wife will show forth the brilliance of the husband. You see, a woman is running around all drug out and just let herself go, you know, after she gets married. I bet you if I was a betting man, all the money I could get my hands on and I'd win every time that that man, he's let himself go. He's let himself run down. He doesn't look like anything. So many times the men will complain about the way their wives look, about the way that they keep their house and this and that. And it is kind of strange, you know, that cute, pretty little thing that looks so sweet you could almost eat her. Later on, you kind of wish that she had it, you know. Because instead of being that sweet little peach, she became pleasingly plump. Just forgot. You know, I like Oral Roberts. Nobody works for Oral Roberts that's overweight. Did you know that? Did you know that? Nobody works for him that's overweight. That's right. You go through his offices, you go across the campus, you'll find everyone that's on the payroll, slim and trim. Look at Brother Roberts himself. Now, we need to take care of ourselves, not only spiritually, but physically as well. I know the scripture says that bodily exercise profiteth little, but I tell you what, there is a little profit in it. Hallelujah. Amen. So take care of yourselves. Now, take care of your wife. Take the word of God and begin to instruct your wife. Now, you're going to find out as you get into God's Word that there is as many scriptures that pertain to the husband as pertains to the wife. And the whole household begins to fall in order. You see, Jesus took his church and he is washing it with the Word of God so that he can present to himself a bride without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. And every man, now, there isn't a man in this room today that wants to go to hell. There's not a man here that wants to go to hell. You wouldn't be here if you wanted to go to hell. I mean, you might get so tired before the evening service is over tonight that whenever you lay down, you wonder if you'll ever wake up or not. But I guarantee you this. There isn't one here that wants to go to hell. You're here to be helped. Every one of us are here to be helped. We want to grow in the Lord. We want to find out what we can do. All right? What we can do is this. We can begin to wash our family, wash our wife, wash our children with the Word of God. My dad had a service station whenever I was a boy growing up. He used to work for dad all the time. And uh, I would get into grease and, and dirt and gum, and, and my hands would get just as dirty and just as black as they could be. But you know, we had some stuff called goop. I'd go in, I'd get a big handful of goop, and I'd rub that goop all over my hands and get it under my fingernails and everywhere else, you know. Then I'd put it under the water, and my hands would be just as nice and clean. Now, don't you wish that you could wash your brain the same way. Don't you wish you could? But did you know that you can? I'm not talking about sticking a, a stick in one ear and poking the brain out the other ear either. 
But I'm talking about the Word of God. We're washed by the Word of God. And we can wash our families. We can wash our wives. We can wash our children. Now, somebody might say, well, I thought that was the wife's place to do that. The wife is to do it as you instruct her and teach her, and then she'll help you in this endeavor. But it falls upon the husband as to being the spiritual as well as the physical head of that household. Every man here today should be praying with his family. Laying hands on his little children and praying for them. Look at Abraham. Look at Isaac. Look at Jacob. Did not they lay their hands upon their children and give them their blessings? Didn't they? And what happened? Whenever those men did that, the blessings of God rested upon their offspring. Hallelujah. Whenever Moses, God said, you're going to die. And he said, go lay your hands upon Joshua. That the spirit of wisdom that dwelleth on you might dwell upon him also. What did he do? He laid his hands upon him. And then the Lord said to Joshua, As I was with Moses, even so will I be with you. Hallelujah. We need to lay hands upon them. If they get rebellious, catch them in the middle of the night and lay hands on them. My granny had two great big old strapling boys. They outgrew her, and, her, and my grandpa was a railroader, and he was gone for three days at a time, and he was home for one or two, and he was gone again. And so there's a lot of absences of the father in the home. She'd catch those great big old teenage boys when they did wrong, and she'd lay hands on them in the middle of the night because she couldn't catch them in the daytime. She'd catch them asleep in the bed, and she'd tie them in the bed and work them over good. Hallelujah. Good old tiny thing. We just sent her home to be with the Lord just in October. Praise God. Hallelujah. Catch them in the middle of the night and lay hands on them. Where well, you had to lay the rod on them or lay your hands on them to pray for it or whatever it is. Do it. Do it. Get the Word of God going. These tapes that are out today, I think tapes are one of the most marvelous things we could ever get hold of. Get the Word of God on tape and play it and play it and play it and play it and saturate your mind. In your home, ladies, whenever you're doing your housework, let the Word of God fill your home. Now, the Lord is telling us how that we... As a family ought to function. Let's just look at this some more. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How should we love our wives? We should love them unto the death. Jesus gave himself for the church. And I'm glad I'm a part of that church. Can you shout amen? Are you part of the church? Hallelujah. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, Jesus never gave up on the church. Never once gave up on it. He kept on keeping on. And don't you give up either. You just keep on keeping on. When it looks like things are getting the blackest and the worst, you just hang in there. Hang in. Because it's the darkest before the dawning. Praise God. It's the darkest before the dawning. Hang in there. I remember one time Harvey Gottschall from Kansas City, Missouri. Came down to Butler, Missouri, where we pastored for eight years. Harvey came, and he said, I want you to pray. I preached that night on Matthew 18, 19. If two shall agree touching anything on earth, it shall be done for them by our Father which is in heaven. He and his wife came forward that night, tears running down their cheeks. He said, Pastor, said, would you pray that God would do something about our son? He said, he's graduate of Columbia University in New York City. He said, we haven't heard from him for three years. So the last we heard of him, said he was in Greenwich Village. Said he's on drugs. So we think he's living with some girl. So we haven't heard from him. So we raised him in church. We raised him on the Word of God. And God's Word says if you'll train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Do you believe that? I believe it. And Harvey, I knew his life. I knew what kind of a man he was. I knew that he instructed his child, and his child got away from it. That evening, we fell on our knees together. And tears ran down my cheeks, and we agreed together in prayer. And the Spirit of God said to me, tell him that he'll hear from his son in 24 hours. It was about 10 o'clock at night. Monday evening rolled around about 8 o'clock. My telephone rang. Harvey got to the other end of the line. His voice trembling so greatly. Said, Pastor McCarroll, Pastor McCarroll. Said, I just hung up the phone. Said, my boy, just call me. Said, he's in New York City and said he wants to come home. Said he's married to that girl. And they've got a little boy. And he said, I want to come, I want to know, should I send the money to him? I said, Don't send him any money. I said, send him a ticket. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Three days later, that boy was home. Today, he's teaching at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. He is a citizen of the United States and one that's productive. He's a born-again Christian serving the Lord God Almighty. Now, I want you to know something. God's Word will take effect. You might not think it is, but it is. Don't give up. Keep on. I like what Lester Roloff said. He's one of my favorite evangelists. I like him. He gets in trouble all the time, so do I, but hallelujah. He said, if you've got a kid, you don't want to go to church and we're full of rebellion. He said, you grab them by the nap of the neck and the seat of the pants. And he said, you get them to church. And if you have to set on to keep them in that pew, he said, you do it till they get saved. And then they'll thank you for it. Uh, you might as well say it, amen. Or only because it's so. I've seen parents, their children, I don't want to go to church. And I've seen others say, well, my daddy made me go to church when I was a little boy, and I ain't going to church no more. And well, I'll tell you what, his daddy didn't set out and make him listen or something. And I want you to know that God is faithful to his word. Stay in there. Stay in there. Put the word of God down deep into him. Hallelujah. If you had to put a tape recorder in their room when they go to bed at night and play it all night long, do it. I remember whenever Brother Ferris was with us back in November this year. <laughs> All the women. We got a bunch of women in our church and their men's lost. We got about 12 families like that. That's bad. And uh, so Brother Ferris said, we got to do something. I said, you're telling me we got to do something. I said, my Lord. I said, this is terrible. All these women saved and their husbands reprobates and hate the church, hate me and everything else, you know. And so that night... He's telling about how God had worked in Indianapolis, I believe it was, and uh, how all the women would bring would bring the men's underclothes and they'd pray over them. And boy, my women got a hold of that. And the next night, they started bringing in men's underclothes and socks in these great big uh, grocery sacks, you know. And all over the altar, we had men's drawers laying out there in their socks. And Brother Miller and I was down there laying hands on the drawers, hallelujah, and anointing them with oil, praying over them, hallelujah. You know what? It works. It works. Hallelujah. Amen. Get a hold of the Word of God. Get the Word of God in there. I'll tell you what, if you've got a mean, cantankerous husband, get you some scripture. Write it out in indelible ink. Sew it on the inside of his clothes. Put it in there. Hallelujah. Put the Word of God right next to his hide and say, God, burn it in there. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God will save that cantankerous man. God will sanctify those cantankerous children and wives. Verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's the way God wants us to be. Holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. No, the Lord never did say it wasn't right to love yourself. He said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. God knew that we loved ourselves better than anybody else. He knew that. Anybody says they don't, something's wrong with them. God knows that. We all know that. But now he said, love others like you love yourself. And particularly your wife. And if a man does not love his wife, he does not love himself. And if a man doesn't love himself, he's basically wrong. Something bad's wrong with him. He's a reprobate. Love your wives, men. Like you love you. There isn't a person here today that let me stomp their foot if they can help it. Brother, would you let me stomp on your foot? <laughs> Amen. I wouldn't let you stomp on mine either. Hallelujah. Now, why is it so many times that we hurt those the most that we live with? Those that we love the most. I see a lot of daddies. They'll make over other people's kids more than they make over their own. I see people who will share more with complete strangers than they'll share with their own wives. In 18 years in the pastorate, I found out that one of the biggest problems in the home is a lack of communication. People won't talk. The husband comes in from work. He walks in. One of my deacons the other day was counseling a young couple. and He said, I used to have the same problem. Boy, that young fellow's eyes woke up. He said, here's what I used to do. He said, I work hard all day. He said, I'm a sheetrock man, plastered. And he said, I'm tired whenever I come in. He said, I'm covered with that old stuff, you know. And said, I would, 
paste and glue. He said, I, I come into the house. And he said, I, I was wore out. I walk in. I say, where's my supper? Now, he's a great big man. He's about six foot three, weigh about 225, looks like a giant, you know. And his wife's little tiny thing, got a little girl, about 11 years old, little tiny girl. He said, I'd walk in like that. And so they just start shaking. So I go take my shower, come out, and my clothes wouldn't be laid out. Where's my clothes at? And he said, one day, he said, things start going wrong in my home. He said, my wife didn't act like she loved me anymore. He said, our little girl was afraid of me. He said, she didn't come around. He said, I began to ask him, what's wrong? He said, they wouldn't talk. They wouldn't tell me. He said, finally, he said, I just got down on my knees before them and said, what's wrong? Why is our home like this? And he said, they begin to tell me. So my little girl looked up and said, Daddy, he said, I'm scared of you. He said, you got such a big old deep voice. And he said, you holler so loud. And he said, it scares me. He said, I just want to run. I just want to get away. He looked over at his wife and she was going like that. So right there, they began to make some adjustments. And boy, whenever he shared that with this young couple that we were counseling, I could see that young man cut his eyes over to his wife and her cut her eyes back over to him. And I saw her go like that. And he dropped his head. No consideration. Love your wife. Jesus said that, that the golden rule is to love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others. You'd have them to do unto you. And at home, we think it don't care. It don't matter. We, say we, we can say anything to our own family and they'll forget it. You know, we can say anything to them. Call them any name. Do any little thing to them. It don't make any difference. It does make a difference. The man who rules not his own spirit is like a city without walls. Your whole household becomes infected with demonic presences. You wonder why your children are hypertension. You wonder why that there's sickness in your home. You wonder about this and you wonder about that. It's because that we have not ruled our own spirits. And you can't rule your spirit until you come under subjection to the authorities of God. And I'm not talking about calling somebody up and saying, pray whether or not I can go down and get groceries today. See what God says about that. That's dumb. You know, all this submitting stuff and this discipleship stuff, you know, is, is really something. It's easy for me to be able to, to be submitted to somebody or disciple to somebody that lives in Florida when I live in Kentucky. Or up in Pennsylvania when I'm down, you know, they're several thousand miles away. That's easy. Now listen, God wants us to come under subjection to his word. As we come under subjection to that, we'll begin to grow and see that seed begin to grow. Let's continue here. My time is running out, and I want to give you some more things. Verse 30. For as many, for as we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined into his wife, or unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now, first of all, we're members of his body, of his bones, of his flesh. Now remember this, we are members of the body of Christ. And we are to function together as a member of a body should function. Care for one another. Someone brought out already in the camp meeting that whenever one member of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. When one member rejoices, they all rejoice. You know, the Mormons really got to jump on us. We're so far behind. We're not, it just makes me sick sometimes the way we drag our feet. Supposed to be full gospel and charismatic and all this, you know. Look at God's gift to the world today. And I see these commercials that the Mormons are putting on. And man, they stir my soul. Here's this little boy coming in. Little fat chubby fella. Just got his report card. And he comes running in the house and the screen door slams. He said, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. He said, I made all A's. And his voice comes from upstairs saying, How many times have I told you not to run in the house and let the door slam behind you? And then look at the face of that little boy. He was so excited. And listen, they're getting their message across. There's some bumper stickers in our area that says, Have you hugged your kid today? You see them? Huh? And what are we doing? We're sitting back. We can't even get along with the Methodist church down the street. 
Or worse than that, the Pentecostal group across town. We can't even have fellowship with him. So busy fighting amongst ourselves. This isn't the answer. The answer is to realize that we're part of the body of Christ. And realize that your wife is part of the body. And that you're part of the body. And your children are part of the body. Isn't a person here today that try to crucify Jesus Christ? There isn't a one here that not take a nail and put through his hands or a crown of thorns and put on his head or curse him. But when we do something wrong to our loved ones, our families, we think it's going to be all right. We, we really do. We really do. But it's not all right. It's not all right. Because when you do it to that wife, or you do it to that husband, or you do it to that child, it's the same thing as doing it to Christ's body. We can't do that and get away with it. We can't. We're going to pay for it. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. My mama told me whenever I told her I was going to marry Bonnie Sue, the first thing she did, she sang me a song. She said, I've heard that song before. <laughs> Daddy always told me, he said, don't ever go out with a girl that you wouldn't consider marrying. I considered marrying all of them. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so she sang me that little song, you know. And then she told me this. She said, you're my son. And whenever you marry a wife, you're not coming back and living under my roof. And you're not bringing some girl under my roof to live. And you're not bringing a bunch of little grandchildren under there either. So whenever you make up your mind that you're going to get married, did you better mean it? And you come home and visit and say, sweetheart, you're on your own. Every parent ought to make that point clear. Hey, my folks sat down and talked to me, and there was no doubt, but I understood what they were saying. Hallelujah. Amen. And this time, whenever I, we as parents, we say, well, honey, if it don't work out, if he don't treat you right when you get married, you can always come back home to daddy. You better be sure, kid, before you marry that thing. I know I'll probably be the hardest daddy in the world when my kids start dating. But we need to talk to them. We let them know and understand the things that's going on. Amen? And then don't all the time be running back home to mama. Running back home to daddy. You have started your own household, and they are, they are now in a line of counselors. There's no one that will ever love you any more in this world than your mom or dad. You know that. But they're not your direct authority now whenever you build your own home. They're in your line of counselors. That's correct. But now you must come under subjection to God yourself. Come under subjection to God completely. And as you do, God's going to bless you. This is a great mystery, he said. But I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I want to call your attention to two more scriptures and then I'm going to close. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Now, there's many other scriptures that I could bring to you in the New Testament dealing with the husband's relationship with the wife. But it would be redundant because we've covered that in Ephesians 5. So let me just simply bring this here in 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Now that's God's knowledge. Dwell with your wife. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, this means more frail, more beautiful. I think my wife's prettier now than she was the day I married her. We was talking about that last night when we went to bed. The day we got married. She asked me, she said, honey, were you scared when we got married? I said, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding? Wow, was I scared. Hallelujah. <laughs> I was very biblical. I was like old Belshazzar was. The joints of my loins were loose and my knees were smoking one against the other just like that. But if I thought I was scared, when I looked down the aisle and I saw her coming on the arm of her daddy, his face, it was about, about the color of this, this sweater I have on today, it was just kind of ashy, old brown, ashy. But Bonnie Sue, her face was plum white. She looked like Lot's wife must have looked when she turned back and turned into a pillar of salt. 
She said, what went through your mind? I said, I didn't know whether I ought to run or stand there. <laughs> yeah, I was scared. Now, recognize this, that the wife is the weaker vessel. I had a man the other day say, well, I bought a new tractor. said, as soon as I teach my wife how to use it now, I said, uh, we're going to be able to get out a whole lot more crops, pay a whole lot more tithes, preacher. I said, did you put your wife out there on a the tractor? Yeah, I said, it's not hard. It's not hard work. Now, folks, that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> Recognize that she is a woman. And you know what? The thing that has made women so unefeminate in this last decade is because men have not allowed them to remain in the place of effeminacy. That's right. Keeping up with the Joneses. Honey, we can't make it. You're going to have to get a job, too. Come on now, the kids are raised, and they're all, you know, they're all in school. You, you've got a lot of time on your hands. Let's go to work. If the men would be honest with their wives and tell them, Honey, I want you to look like a woman. I want you to dress frilly. I want you to smell like a woman should smell. I want you to be curly around the head. I want you to be the type of person that turns me on. You'll find out something. These women really do want to please you. They really do. But if you don't tell them what you want, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. Everybody got awful quiet now. <laughs> tell them about it. Tell them about it. Lord, we had this little cannibal come to our church one time. Yeah, he was. He's a cannibal from South America. And uh, I forgot his name. He's about this tall. And he, really, he had sharp teeth, you know, pointed to all that kind of stuff. And he was saved. And God saved him. And, and, and uh, great, he ate four or five white people one time when he was a little boy. You know, his old tribe did. And then he was captured by some people. And uh, he escaped. And then he came to America. And uh, he didn't know where he was going, just trying to get away, you know. Finally got to America. And then after a while, he got civilized. And, and he, he was in an airport this particular day. And... He said he saw this beautiful, blonde-headed lady. And he'd never seen a blonde-headed woman before. And, of course, in their country, when you want a wife, you just went and took her, you know. And so he was kind of civilized, but he still had some of these other ways, you know. And so he thought, boy, said a blonde-headed wife, said, that'd be all right. And so he headed to, over there to her. And uh, I don't know, maybe uh, for some reason this blonde headed woman started walking away and so he being short he had to run to try to catch up he said I finally caught her and said whenever she turned around said she had a beard <laughs> food you didn't hallelujah somebody said the other day he said uh, your hair is too long fellas when you have to grow sideburns in a goatee to prove that you're a man. Now, there is a distinction that God made between the sexes. And as God's people chosen for this hour and this time, we should make it so distinctive that there is absolutely no question about it. Whenever somebody comes up behind you and tries and wonder, is that a lady or is that a man? That goes on both sides. Did you know today that the great move in women's and men's fashions is the unisex look? And did you know that our fashions today are being designed by homosexuals? Barbara Walters, when she was yet on the Today program, interviewed several of the leading fashion designers, and they were all gay. Isn't that a dumb word, gay? We had a better word for them when I was a kid. Thank God for people like Anita Bryan. And every one of you ought to be standing up for it. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, we need to recognize some things. We need to recognize the wife as a fairer, most beautiful than you are. And the man is masculine. Boy, you keep that. And these little kids coming up today, they, they're trying to identify with you. They're trying to identify and some kids are really having a terrible problem in identifying. That's right. Do you know what? The, one of the most leading articles of clothing among men today 
in England being sold right in the department stores. The leading item of clothing for men is silk panties. My God. You see, whenever a man rules not his own spirit, he's like a city without walls. And all of these devils start coming in. Every one of them. Verse 7 again, 1 Peter 3. And as being heirs together of the grace of life. Not one of you is going to inherit. Not just the man, but both of you. Did you know that you're responsible for that woman's soul? Whenever you marry her... Not only are you responsible to take care of her physically, but you're to take care of her spiritually. You are heirs together. Heirs together of the grace of life. Heirs together. And I don't care how spiritual that woman gets. She'll not get as spiritual as God wants her to get until that man comes around and becomes the man of God that God wants him to become. God will not hinder you from coming on in the Lord. If you make up your mind that God's coming first in your life and there'll be nothing else that'll separate you from God, from your family in Christ Jesus. Love that woman. God made the woman different. She's like kindling. She'll catch fire in a hurry. Yes, she will. She'll burn quick. A man's like an old oak log, like we used to put in at night as a backup log. Burn all night long, old oak logs. He'll burn and burn and burn and burn and burn when the kindling's already burned up. And you know, in the relationship that I've had with families as pastor for these years, I've seen families that whenever the husband was sold out to God, hell itself could begin to roar. And there'd be members of the family start to shake, you know, being moved by these things that the devil of the world. But that old man, man, he was just as solid as an old oak log. Come on, honey, we're going to church today. When we started deliverance in our church, really started it. And I had to get up and apologize to my people because I had backed off from it for a number of years because of all the personal criticisms and all this and that that was involved. And then also some excesses that we saw that were not biblical that we didn't want to get into at that time. And I had to apologize them because I had thrown out the whole baby with the mess, you know. But when we started in deliverance, I say, we only cast out some devils, but we cast out some people along with them. Hallelujah. We heard it like a three-ring circus down there. I guess, you know, if I put myself back in that position, it'd be about right. Hallelujah. <laughs> if somebody over here throwing five or six people around, you know, and uh, somebody over here screaming and some, you know, but God was doing something. Hallelujah. And so there were some people that was lost very quickly to our fellowship, very quickly. But... God began to work. And today, all of those have been replaced, plus a whole lot more God's put in. That's just been in a period of about, what, five months now, four or five months since August. And God's blessing and moving on. Now, we must realize that sometimes there's going to be a falling away before there's a catching hold. But you keep on doing the things that God's told you to do. The last part of that verse said that your prayers be not hindered. Whenever you don't treat your wife, when the wife does not treat the husband, when they both do not treat the children as they ought to treat them, your prayers are going to be hindered. Just like the prayers of Daniel were hindered in the 10th chapter of Daniel, when he prayed and fasted for 21 days, and the angel of God was sent, dispatched to bring the answer to Daniel, but he couldn't get to him. Because the prince of Grecia withstood him. A spiritual force, a demonic force, stood against the answer of God's word. Daniel's prayers were hindered. Now, Daniel hadn't done anything wrong. But you and I, whenever we do not do as God's word tells us that we should do, our prayers will be hindered. How many of you want your prayers answered all the time? Start loving on one another. Show your kids that you love them. Bonnie Sue told me one time that she'd never seen her mother or daddy embrace. Man, my kids have to shut their eyes to keep seeing us embrace. Hallelujah. 
Show your children that you love one another. Talk to your wife in front of your children and say, I love you. Let them know it. Show your kids that you love them. Did you know there's something in every man here today that'd like to go back and just crawl up on his daddy's lap? I'd like to crawl up on my daddy's lap. There's a little boy that lives inside of me, Brother Turner. There's one lives in you, too. Oh, how I'd like to just crawl up on his lap and feel his old strong arms around him. And what you would like to do, that little child that dwells in your home would like to do a hundred thousand times even more. Show him you love him. Hold him. Caress him. Tell him you love him. Show them you love them. And your prayers are not to be hindered. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21. It has a real important promise for us right there. 1 John 3, 21. And then I'm done, Brother Glenn. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not. Now, many times, spirit and heart are synonymous in the Scripture. In this case, it's the same. Proverbs 25, 28, he who ruleth not his own spirit. Here, beloved, if our heart or if our inner man, if our spirit condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. That word confidence can also be translated faith. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's what we want. That's what we need. Do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Do what the Word of God tells us to do. Then our heart will not condemn us. Our inner man will be in perfect harmony and subjection with God our Father. And whatever we ask of the Father, we'll receive. And that's what I want for me. That's what I want for you. And that's what God wants for all of us. Love one another. Care for one another. And let the glory of God rest upon your homes and upon your lives in a mighty way. And I guarantee you there'll be a spiritual wall built around about you. A hedge a devil can't get through. He can't get around. He can't dig deep enough to get under it. And he can't jump or fly high enough to come over it. God will build a hedge about you and pour his blessings out upon you right in the middle of it. Hallelujah. 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 Now maybe you're sitting here today and say, what can I do about relationships in my home. All right, you can start right now. Right now, by asking God to forgive if your husband's done wrong. Or maybe you don't have a husband any longer. Maybe the devil destroyed your marriage. You can forgive. And not from up here, but from down here. Somebody once said to me, well, I can forgive, but I won't forget. Oh, no. I'm glad that God forgave and forgot my sins. Amen. Buried them in the sea of forgetfulness. Moving away from me as far as the east is from the west. Isn't that beautiful? One time there was a man who did me real wrong and I thought I'd forgiven him. Until I went to a meeting and he was one of the chief speaker. When he's up there speaking, I supposed to speak too. While he's up there speaking, I seethed with rage on the inside. My stomach tied up in knots. You ever been that way? He's tied up in knots. I had to go to that man the first opportunity. And I said, sir, I said, you did me very, very badly. But I've been suffering for it today and not you. He was having the time of his life and I was suffering. I said, therefore, I want you to know that I forgive you because I'm not going to suffer for what you did. I forgive you in the name of Jesus Christ. I looked at him face to face, eyeball to eyeball. He looked back and he put his arm around me and said, Oh, Bruder Bacado. He said, Forget it. He was from across the waters. He talked that way, Bruder Bacado. Forget it. And he said, Come and go with me to my country. I thought, No, no. Even a dog knows better to put his nose in the same stove twice. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But you must forgive. Forgive that person. Ask God to forgive them. And then, above all things, forgive yourself. For no root of bitterness will grow up in you. Any family relationship that's that way, do it that way. And God will restore order to your life and harmony to you. Then walk daily the way he wants you to. He's got things prepared for you and I that eyes not seen, 
Ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man. And that's not all for the hereafter. I said, that's not all for the hereafter. It's for right now, too. I want it now. Let's stand together, please. Blessed Father, I'm thankful that through the power of the Holy Spirit and through your word that every one of us in this building and wherever people might gather can control their own spirit. Now, Lord, help us to appropriate your word and your spirit in such a fashion that this will be done. And, Lord, help us this morning to repair broken bridges between ourselves, particularly as families. Lord, help love to be the highway in our hearts, running to and fro. Lord, we want your undefiled agape love. Bless these people, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you've given me a message for them this day. And Lord, may this message go deep in our hearts. May our homes be a city of refuge, a joy to be in, a delight. Lord, may we delight in our little children. May we delight in one another. And may we delight most of all in you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask all of us here this morning, as so many of us, We've got a lot of room up here in the front. I'm going to ask us to take a, a few moments right now, leave our seat, and just come and stand across the front and to pray for every member of our immediate family. Would you come right now, please, and let's do it. You might want a new rope. good if you could stand or kneel by your family. If every family unit could get together now. Amen. Just pray for them. Pray for that precious wife. Pray for that precious husband. Pray for those darling little children that are a gift from God. Pray for that mom. Pray for that dad. Pray for that brother. Pray for that sister. Pray for that husband-to-be of that little girl. That wife-to-be of that little boy or that little grandchild. Pray for them. Pray for them. If there's been some hurt, if there's been some wrongdoing, confess it to the Father. Ask Him to forgive that person. Just get it all out. Just get it all under the blood. Then just forgive yourselves. Forgive yourself. Today, as we stand here, if you're separated from your wife or separated from your husband, is it irreparable? Is it beyond repair? Isn't there something that could be done? Isn't there? Couldn't you do something through God? I want every husband with his wife here today, just put your arm around her. I want you to tell her that you love her. Tell her you love her. Tell her you love her. One day in a service like this, I heard her shouting going on. This woman threw her hands up there. Later on, she said, that's the first time in 20 years. That man stood there and wept, and he said, there'll not be another 20 years go by, but I'll tell you every day. Hallelujah. And there's one final thing that we need to consider. Whenever we do not rule our own spirit, we're like a city without walls. Maybe there's some things that we need to take authority over today. Maybe there's been some demonic presences that's entered into your home, in your life, in the life of your family, that we need to take authority over. There's been people who've already told me, my children are on dope. 
They're smoking pot. They're doing this. They're doing that. Now, right now, we've made some great steps forward. But I'm thoroughly convinced that any type of narcotic is demonic. Any type of use of it, when you use it, you open yourself up to a horde of demons. The Lord can set you free. If you're here today and you'd like for us to pray a prayer with you, a prayer of deliverance, our God's here to deliver you. You feel that, brother? I really feel that in my heart. Maybe you need deliverance for your whole family. There's spirits of divorce that can destroy each generation. Each generation. We've had it in our church. We've got three generations in one family. Every one of them been divorced. Every one of them. That's a spirit that Jesus Christ can set you free from it. Amen. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor McCarroll, I, I want prayer in our family for deliverance. Would you just hold up your hand real high, please? All right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Amen. With your hands raised, would you just come up near the front? Come on up to the altar. If you would just step back a step and let these people get in. But don't, don't go back to your seat. Just stay here to pray. Maybe you can help. Amen. 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 Brother Miller, come ahead and help us. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of the Almighty God. Blessed be the name of the Almighty God. All right, let's just do this in mass. Then we'll take it individually after that if we need it. Pray with me now. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you now realizing that demonic presences threatens my family. I know that the blood of Jesus Christ preserves us, saves us, sanctifies us, makes us worthy. I plead the blood of Jesus all over my family, all over every member of our family. Father, mother, children, every one of us covered by the blood of Jesus. Now, Satan, I come against you. I break every curse that you would try to bring upon us back to seven generations on both sides of the family. Jesus Christ took the curse upon himself when he was hung upon the cross. I relieve you, Satan, and all of your host of every legal grounds for abiding in our family. We want nothing to do with you. I want nothing to do with you. And I command you to take your hands off of our family, every demonic presence. Be gone now in the name of Jesus Christ. I cast you out now in Jesus' name. Go, go, go. Now take a deep breath and exhale as hard as you can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 And whenever you get back home, when you go back to your home, when the camp meeting's over, maybe there's some member of the family that isn't here. I want you to establish rapport with him. Godly rapport. Go through your home. Go through every room in that home. Open up all the cabinets, all the closets. Sanctify the whole house. Go through it and pray. Anoint your home with oil. Read the word in every room. And command every demonic presence to leave. Every one of them. 
Sometimes you'll buy a home that many evil things have gone in before. That home needs to be sanctified and dedicated to Christ to get rid of the evil influences that are there. You'd be surprised how many evil influences will remain in a home when a family will remove or be gone. Now, God has done some great things around this altar this morning. I want you to take it. Rejoice in the Lord. Raise your hands to heaven. Just thank him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank the Lord for the blessing. Thank the Lord for the word, for the understanding of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, the blessing of the Lamb of God. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.